Do please take your seats. Welcome here to the Mets today. It's great to be together. Wonderful to witness those child dedications and to celebrate the gift of new life. We uh, continue this morning in 1 Corinthians in our series, and I'll say this is the final Sunday in 1 Corinthians for a little while. We'll be moving over uh, to our Christmas series as of next week, and we're going to be spending a bit of time together in the opening uh, two chapters of Luke's gospel over the Christmas season. So that begins next week. But today we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'd be grateful if you could turn there with me. This is page 953 if you'd like to use a church Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm going to read from verse 10 down to the end of the chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, although he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God, for it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future, all are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Let's pray together as we begin. Our Father, how we thank you that we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, and in him we belong to you, and so all things are ours in you. We pray that you would teach us more of the nature of your great building, the Church of Jesus Christ, this morning. Cause us to marvel in our privilege and our position before you and teach us what it means to participate in the building of your church in a way that honors you and in a way that will stand the test of time and of eternity. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've ever been involved in a building project of any kind, you will know how vitally important it is that the building is built properly and well with the right materials of true quality at every stage. It's possible, of course, to build something quickly and to make it even look attractive, perhaps even impressive, but to build it in such a way that the building cannot stand the test of time. I don't know what you think about this. I tend to think that the 1960s was a pretty bad time for building, for architecture. You know, 1960s utilitarian and brutalist buildings haven't generally aged very well, in my opinion. Back in the UK, where we lived for uh, many years, the 1960s was a time of quote-unquote modernization, a time of kind of clearing out the old Victorian and Georgian buildings and putting up these sort of squared off modern structures constructed of the latest sort of innovative materials, generally that program, which was taken up very enthusiastically, especially by government departments that yielded terrible results. While I was doing my doctoral studies, I've mentioned before I worked as a teacher in a, in a very historic boys' school in London. The school itself had been founded in the year 1509, although they'd moved locations a number of times. The last location of the school 
had been a rather grand red brick Victorian uh, building in West London. But in the 1960s, the school had this opportunity to buy a bigger piece of land south of the river to relocate, which they did. And on that land, they elected to build a gray box-like structure <laughs> covered in pebbled sheets of concrete with no architectural merit of any kind attached to it. By the time I was involved in the school, the 1960s blocks had aged really badly and were near the end of their usable life. There was no way they could squeeze more years out of them. They were so badly built. They just had to be torn down and reconstructed. And so a massive campaign was undertaken to tear down the whole thing and to rebuild. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is using the imagery of a building to teach us about the nature of the church and the way in which the church of Jesus Christ is constructed. And he wants us to see that care is needed at every stage. He is wanting us to see that only the finest materials will do. He is wanting us to see that the quality and the integrity of God's building, the church, it matters immensely to God himself. God owns it. God loves it. God will protect it, and he will hold every worker to account for the work they do on his precious building. As we dig into these verses together, a key thing, perhaps the key thing that we are going to discover is that local church ministry matters. It matters. How God's building is put together, it matters to him. It ought to matter to us. You see, if our perspective is that church is our hobby, it is a recreation. It is a social activity that fills a part of our weekend when it's convenient to do so. If that's our perspective, well, this passage will turn our assumptions on their head, and it will tell us that gospel ministry within the church of Jesus Christ is more important and more significant than we can possibly know or imagine. God cares about it more than we realize. And the long-term implications of good ministry or of bad ministry are more weighty, more far-reaching than we might ever assume. And so, perhaps as a corrective to our outlook and to our assessment of what really matters, Paul has three truths for us here concerning the ministry of the gospel within the church of Jesus Christ. Three truths about the way in which God's great building, His church, is built. And the first one is this, God's great building has only one foundation. Notice it again with me there in verse 1. According to the grace of God given me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. To hearken back to another school building, a different one, I remember when I was at high school in Toronto, my high school undertook a great building project. The project uh, provided, I guess, a degree of entertainment and diversion for us because it, it progressed all around us during the school year, and we got to observe quite closely what was going on at every stage. Part of the project involved filling in a, a courtyard in the middle of the school with a, a very modern addition. The school building itself was quite traditional, kind of Georgian in style, built around all these courtyards. But this one was going to be filled in with a multi-story modern glass annex that would join up with the historical building on multiple floors. It was quite fascinating to watch the building work take place from the classroom windows in the old building surrounding the courtyard. At first, they had to excavate this old co courtyard quite deep. I think it was a two-level basement uh, below and then a foundation below that. So, so the thing went really far down. One thing that really interested me was that they undertook the foundation work in the middle of the Toronto winter. So it was pretty cold when they were pouring the concrete. This was some years ago. And at that time, that was really quite novel. Normally, you waited until the, the warmer weather to pour a foundation back then. But it was explained to us, and they told us, that they were using very innovative technology at the time, specially formulated cement that was engineered chemically to be able to set well 
in sub-zero conditions. I, of course, knew nothing about such things. I still know nothing about such things. But I remember thinking to myself, that just feels like a little bit of a risk. You're investing millions of dollars, I guess, putting up five or six stories of cutting-edge building, all on a foundation of concrete that has to do its best to set properly in the middle of the Canadian winter. The building might be beautiful, but if the foundation isn't solid, disaster looms. A little while ago, I watched a TV program with one of our kids all about the building of some of the tallest skyscrapers in the world. And of course, these great looming towers, 100 stories tall and more, thousands of people living and working in the many, many cities in the sky, they sit on this very small footprint, don't they? They rest on a foundation that's got to be deep and it's got to be strong, firm, and reliable. If the foundation is bad, well, it is a disaster in the making. There is one foundation for the church, one true and stable and safe foundation, and one alone. It is Jesus Christ himself. It is the message of Jesus Christ. It's preached by the apostles. That is the only foundation possible. It is the only foundation the church could ever have. Now, again, the crisis in Corinth stems from the fact that the members of the church were choosing their favorite leaders, if you remember, and they were rallying around different leaders teachers within the church. We've spoken about that at some length in our series already. You'll remember that, that some within the church, they liked Paul. Others weren't so keen on Paul, but they liked Apollos, or others liked Cephas. But Paul wants to be clear. Anyone who is engaged in authentic gospel ministry, anyone who is truly building the church, they are only building on the foundation that he laid as an apostle of Jesus Christ. They are only building upon the foundation of the gospel that he, the Lord's apostle, has proclaimed. And so, of course, no one could be so arrogant as to write off the apostle Paul. No one could dismiss his ministry. No one could sidestep his work. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Someone else is building upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Paul the Apostle had a special role assigned to him, a special grace given to him by God, and it was to communicate the message of Jesus Christ in authoritative terms, to lay out the gospel message truly and clearly, to take the message of Jesus and his cross and to set it down so that the church would know it and believe it. Paul preached that message at Corinth. He recorded it in his letters and with the other apostolic writings of the New Testament, we now have this foundation, the apostolic message, fixed in written form in our Bible with clarity and with truth. That's the foundation. And the church of Jesus Christ is built upon it. Any true church is built upon this foundation of the message of Jesus as set out by the apostles, as written down in the scriptures, there is none other. If a church, if a teacher is not grounded in the gospel message as recorded in the apostolic writings of the New Testament, here's the thing, they are not building a church. They are building something else. And of course, that only makes sense. Jesus and his cross, Jesus and his gospel, that's everything for us. That is all we have. The message of Jesus is the message that there is forgiveness for the sinner because the Savior died. It's the message that there is acceptance for the unacceptable because the Savior was first rejected. It's the message that there is life from the dead because the Savior rose from the grave. It's the only message that brings any hope for the future, any comfort and purpose for this life. It's all we have. Now, before we, we move on from this foundational point, there are two simple but profoundly important implications from it that the church has one foundation. The message of Jesus Christ as proclaimed by the apostles is communicated by the scriptures. The, the first implication of this is that we need to ste steer very clear of any movement or organization or so-called church that does not have its foundation in Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, in Paul's Jesus. 
You see, there are plenty of movements and cults around that are not built on the one foundation. They may claim to be churches, they may claim to be Christian, but they are built upon a different foundation. They don't accept Paul's proclamation of Jesus Christ. They don't accept the apostolic message. They have their own version, a false narrative, and the foundation is different. Beware of them. Beware of them. See, Paul is very concerned about Christian unity. He hates all the infighting at Corinth. That's one of the reasons he's written this letter. But he's very clear. Unity is only possible where the foundation is shared, where the basis is sound. Unity is only possible where the church has been built on the one foundation of Jesus Christ. Don't be fooled by a fake movement, a fake church, a false Christianity. Don't be pressured ever into pursuing unity where there is no shared foundation. There is one and one alone. The second implication here is just to remember that we do not and must not take credit for establishing anything when it comes to the church and the work of the gospel. If we've been involved in gospel work and gospel projects, if we've participated in funding any movement, if we've contributed to planting a church, if we have participated in world missions and so on, we need to remember that we are only ever builders on a work site, but the foundation has already been laid. Jesus has done it all. He has given his life. The apostles have proclaimed the word and set it down in the scriptures. The credit does not go to us the initiative, the innovation, the impetus, it's never ours. So we must be careful never to overstate our own role or overestimate our own importance. God's great building, it has only one foundation. That's the first lesson. And the next one is this. God's great building must be built with care. Notice Paul's admonition at the end of verse 10, let each one take care how he builds upon it. He continues, verse 12, now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. In your workplace, in your profession, I, what are, I wonder what are the ramifications and the implications of shoddy work. I mean, I wonder what happens if you do something poorly or you use low-quality equipment or materials in your work. We have some surgeons among us here. I think you would say that the implications of doing shoddy work are pretty dramatic in your field if you are a surgeon. We have some civil engineers in our midst. I think we all care that the bridges we drive over are put together properly, made with good materials. We have some among us who work in the aerospace industry. I think we would all agree that we care that the engineers and the manufacturers of the planes we fly in across the ocean, that they're on their game, that they are taking every precaution, are using only the best materials. We have some among us who are in the food services industry. It matters that you are taking every precaution for hygiene, good kitchen practices, proper storage and refrigeration. If you don't do that, people fall ill. For those who engage in any form of ministry, any form of Christian leadership, Paul says, be careful how you build the church. Take care in your gospel work. The implications are significant, more significant perhaps than you ever realized. We need to take care how we build. We need to be careful in the work of ministry. We need to apply our best efforts to it, our best energy, our best praying, our most careful work, and we need to be sure that we are using only the best materials. You see, it's possible when building to opt for cheap materials. I mentioned the other day I was working on a little project at home. I, I decided that I would uh, retile a couple of sections of flooring on our main floor in our house, primarily just the entranceway as you come in. This was a, a very bold and an uneducated uh, decision. 
uh, uneducated for uh, someone who has never laid down a tile in his life to try and do this. But, you know, once you start smashing up the old tiles, you're kind of committed. You know, you need to carry through at that stage. Well, thinking that it would be good, as I normally do think, that, you know, to do this as cheaply as possible, I went to the big box home improvement store and I, I saw piles of inexpensive tiles all stacked on the floor and I, I, I did the math and I figured we could have this job done for almost no money and you know the tiles, they, they would be okay, they would be fine. <clears throat> but Gemma pointed out um, that if you're going to do all the work of smashing up the old tile and laying down new tile, you probably want to put down some flooring that you'd actually want to look at you know, some flooring of decent quality. Go, going cheap on the new flooring won't be a decision that's going to wear well in the long run. You're going to want to smash it up again before too long. As an older man once said to me when I was trying to save money on something and I was clearly being a bit stupid about it, here's the saying, some savings are not really a saving. That's a truism. Sometimes trying to save something now costs you more in the future. When it comes to gospel work, we do have a choice of materials to use, and we need to choose carefully. We need to be discerning. You see, we could take a very good foundation and then lay cheap materials on top of it, but what a mistake that would be, verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. Wood may have its uses in a building, but hay and straw, you're not building a temple or a house with that. You are setting up a bonfire. I wonder if you've ever seen gospel ministry done with cheap materials that won't last. A teacher speaks to a people who had a good gospel foundation. A new pastor comes along, and he's full of messages of self-help, a bit of fluffy entertainment, jokes and anecdotes, worldly wisdom perhaps, but little more than that. And, and over time, the building is raised on hay and on straw, and you know that the slightest breeze of difficulty or opposition will blow the whole thing down. There is nothing solid about it, nothing that will stand the test of time. Have you ever seen that happen in a ministry, in a church? Be careful. It's tempting to build with the cheap materials. It might be easier. It probably is less effort. It might look like progress is happening more quickly. There's more of an initial response to ministry that's really just entertainment. People like that for a short period of time, but there's no future in it. No. Steer clear of that. Focus on the good stuff. Use only the best, lasting materials, gold, silver, precious stones. Now, I think we would agree that that sounds wise in principle, but here's the question. What actually is the gold, uh, the silver, the precious stones? What is Paul actually referring to here? Well, isn't it the same material that the foundation was made of? Verse 11, the foundation of Jesus Christ himself. Isn't that how Paul built Isn't that the only material he used, chapter 2 and verse 2? For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You see, that is the only material of quality and of worth with which to build the church. The message of Jesus Christ and him crucified, the message of the gospel, the message of the Bible, that's the gold, that's the silver, that's the precious stones. Anything else? Hay and straw. Now, again, we need to be convinced and reconvinced that this is actually true. We need to be reminded that the only building work that is worth anything in the kingdom of God is building work undertaken with the gospel through the ministry of the word. If we want our labor in the kingdom to stand the test of time and to have real value, we need to speak of Jesus Christ and of him crucified. We need to proclaim the word of God and teach the word of God. We need to get that truth into hearts and into lives. 
We need to see people come to living faith in Jesus Christ, to know him, to love him, to walk with him, to make him known. That is, that is what it is to build with quality materials, to invest in the future with something solid and good and actually worthwhile. You see, we can busy ourselves with activity in the name of ministry. We can entertain people. We can keep them busy. We can generate a little buzz of community. We can do some kindly social work in the community. But if we are not getting the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified into hearts and into lives, we're not building anything. We're not building anything solid that's going to stand the test of time and of eternity. We're putting up temporary structures with cheap material that will be swept away. Here at the Met, we have a mission statement which will be familiar to the church family, at least grounded in the Great Commission. Here it is. Our mission is to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ, together engaging people with the gospel, establishing believers in the gospel, and equipping servants of the gospel in our nation's capital and the nations of the world. That's our mission. Now, we are relentless and just a little bit ruthless about asking of every ministry activity, every missions endeavor, does this activity further our mission as we understand it from Scripture? And if, after reflection, we determine that this endeavor does that, we then pursue it. And if it doesn't, then we don't. Often when we're evaluating a ministry or an activity, either one that is ongoing or one that is proposed for the future, I'll just ask the team as we're chewing on it, does this fit our mission? And if so, how? D does this make disciples of Jesus Christ through the proclamation of the gospel? And you know, often the question answers itself almost immediately. It's very interesting. We, we look at the ministry activity, we consider our mission and our mandate, and we know the answer one way or another. You see, we want to build with gold, with silver, with precious stones. We want our ministry investment to stand the test of time and of eternity. We've thought of the image of poorly built buildings uh, crumbling and aging badly, but I think we've also all seen and experienced uh, buildings built well and standing the test of time. I think of visiting French chateau in the Loire Valley, still beautiful today as the day they were built because the craftsmanship and the materials were superb. I think of visiting English cathedrals like St. Paul's or Westminster Abbey, still glorious in their structure and their details because care was taken and only the best materials were used. The finest skilled laborers were employed. We took our kids to visit Oxford some months ago. Gem and I had studied there and we met there, but the children hadn't really seen it. And we walked the streets and we visited some of the landmarks in the colleges. We, we took them to see Christchurch College, a college famous for its grandeur, its extraordinary dining hall and grand, grand quadrangles and so on. Construction began in the 16th century, and the buildings today look as beautiful as they must have looked when first built, only the finest materials used. Friends, we want our work in ministry to stand the test of time. And we're mindful that the quality of our work will be evaluated and revealed in due course. There's a sobering note here that Paul draws out, and we need to be mindful of this, verse 12. Notice it there with me. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. The coming day of judgment will ultimately show the quality of our work, because the judgment will disclose whether the people under our care and within the scope of our ministry actually know the gospel. That's what's going to be revealed. Were they part of the true building, the temple of God, that is the church of Jesus Christ? They may have participated in engaging events with us. They may have enjoyed being part of our community, but did they hear the gospel? Did they hear of Christ and him crucified? Were they called to repent of sin? Were they invited to find forgiveness through his shed blood, through his death in our place? Were they exhorted to respond to the gospel? 
You see, we can do all sorts of very nice things for people in the name of ministry, but if we are not preparing them for the coming judgment through preparing, presenting Jesus Christ and Him crucified to them, we are giving them a flimsy shed for shelter in the face of a coming firestorm. And when the fire comes, the structure will be worthless and the storm of judgment will consume them. We're seeing, aren't we, many images of fires these days, wildfires that are out of control in different parts of the world. Paul, in verse 13, describes the coming judgment of God as a fire. There's lots of discussion now, isn't there, about uh, building structures uh, to be fire-resistant, fire-proof in these fire-vulnerable regions of the world. Well, I'll tell you what's not fire-resistant, wood, hay, and straw not fire resistant. When the fire of judgment comes, what will stand? What will endure? Only material of true quality, only the gospel. And so for the gospel worker here, for the Christian leader especially, for you and for me as we engage in gospel ministry, there is a day that is coming that will reveal the quality of our work, and it could be a day of some embarrassment if we're not careful now. Or it could be a day of great joy, verse 14. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. The prospect of a looming evaluation always serves, doesn't it, to focus the mind. I remember in my teaching days when we knew that a government inspection was looming for the school, everyone was on high alert. The quality of your lesson planning and your record keeping, it suddenly mattered in a more urgent way. When our kids have a test at school looming, it has to be totally silent in the car on the way into school, no music, no conversation, total focus. Nothing else matters that morning, the morning of a test. Paul wants us to know that God will indeed evaluate our ministry at the final day. For the believer, salvation is not at issue here. It's not a question of us losing out on salvation if our ministry has been of poor quality. The believer is secure. Our salvation is in no way grounded on our performance. But at the final day, at the judgment seat of Christ, we might experience the regret and embarrassment of seeing our efforts burned up. There will be reward if our efforts were built with the gospel and the work survives and the work endures. It may simply be that we uh, experience the reward of the joy of that, of seeing people in the kingdom of God with us because of our ministry, the joy of God's commendation of our labors, his well done, good and faithful servant. It may be the reward of further responsibility within the kingdom. Paul doesn't say here, but there will be reward and there will also be disappointment depending on the quality of the work. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that very, very sobering to think about. I find it focuses my mind when I think about gospel ministry, and it makes me want to ensure all the more that I'm building well, that I'm using the right material, investing for the future. Paul's focus here is no doubt on Christian leaders, pastors, teachers. That's his main focus. But I think it's important to say here that if we belong to Jesus Christ, all of us are involved in ministry. You see, we each have opportunity and we each have responsibility to witness to the Savior, to those around us, to our family, our colleagues, our friends, our neighbors. We are all involved in the building project of God, the construction of His building, His church, His people. So with that in mind, let me ask you, are you taking care? Are you being careful how you build? Are you mindful of using only the finest materials, only the apostolic word, only the scriptures, only the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified? Friends, let's build carefully. Let's build well with the word of God, the gospel. Let's build for time and let's build for eternity, mindful that our contribution will be evaluated at the final day. God's great building has one foundation. It must be built with care. And finally, as we close now, God's great building is precious to him. Verse 16. Do you know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. 
If we had wondered what building Paul might have had in mind in his mind's eye when he used the image of building for the work of ministry, we now know he was picturing actually the temple of God. And of course, when we think of the precious materials that Paul listed earlier, that reminds us, of course, of the precious materials used in building the temple of Solomon's temple at an earlier stage of Israel's history. But now Paul says God's temple, his dwelling place is not a physical structure, it's you. It's his saved people. It's his church. That's where God dwells on earth. That's the building project in which we are engaged. And this building project, it matters deeply to God. As with any owner, any builder, pouring himself into a grand project, God himself cares deeply about his building. He is protective of it. It matters to him. He cares that it is built properly and well. He is personally invested. And should anyone threaten God's building, he will bring judgment upon them. Paul has just spoken of how teachers will be evaluated. Salvation there was not at issue. True believers who teach in the church, they need not fear losing their salvation. But those who would seek to destroy his church, well, that's another matter. And here Paul is taking us right back to the issue that's been lingering since the start of the letter in which he returns to now, the issue of stirring up division within the church of Jesus Christ, dividing into factions, forming cliques around certain leaders. That issue, it's been on the radar right since the start of the letter, and Paul hasn't forgotten about it. He hasn't set it aside. Seeing how precious the church is to God the Father, Paul wants to emphasize again how serious the issue of destroying and tearing apart the church is. The one who would destroy the building of God through stirring up division, that one will prove they are truly not of the faith and will face the judgment of God. Paul, Apollos, Cephas, they've sought to build the church, but those stirring up divisions are actually tearing it down. And, and we don't know all the details of everything that was taking place there, but, but the warning is serious. Some at Corinth were seeking human wisdom, the world's wisdom, and as they sought the world's wisdom, they were disparaging Paul and the others who didn't satisfy their appetites for that teaching. Rather than uniting around the gospel, factions were forming, the church was dividing. If the proclamation of Christ cru crucified will build up the church, this kind of silliness will tear it down. And Paul wants to stamp that out, verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Don't get caught up in the empty pursuit of human wisdom, in the factions and in the divisions, in the fighting, in the personality cults. If anyone is seeking human wisdom, they need to learn again the wisdom of God in the gospel. As believers, all things are yours. You know, you're in a position of such privilege. You belong to Jesus Christ, says Paul, and Jesus Christ belongs to the Father. God the Father is committed to you, deeply committed to you. He's given the foundation, his own son. He's protecting you, and he will judge any who would destroy you. As his people, his church, his children, you have security in him for time and for eternity. How is the church built? What kind of ministry builds the church? It's built on one foundation of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's built with care. Only the finest materials may be used, only the Word of God, only the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it is all built under the watchful eye of the Father, to whom the church is precious, to whom you and I matter more than we will ever fully know. Friends, how privileged we are to be this building, the temple of the living God, and how careful we must be to guard it from division and to build it in faithfulness and in integrity. Let's pray together as we close. God, our Father, we praise you for your grand building project in the church of Jesus Christ. 
We thank you that you have included us in your building by faith in your Son. And we thank you that you grant us the privilege of participating in the work of ministry, in, in the construction of this grand building. We pray that in our day and our age we might be found faithful in this work, that you would cause us to use only the material you have given, the finest material, the gospel of salvation, the word of God. And we pray that at that final day when we stand before you and our service of you is evaluated at the judgment seat of Christ, we pray that we would have no cause for shame, but only gratitude and rejoicing. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.